Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Jim Baker Show. Thank you for inviting us into your home today. Jim is taking a rest day today. He's just not up to it. So I said, honey, just go ahead and take a rest day. I mean, he will try to be here every single day if he can. But there are just some days that um, I just say, you need a rest day, and today's one of those days. So just keep praying for Jim. He's healing. He's doing great as far as all that goes, everything that he's been through from the stroke and to all his blood sugar situations. But um, he just needed to rest today. And sometimes it's good just to take a rest day if you can. So he said, Lori, Mondo, little Lori is with us today. And Maricela's back at the office running everything behind the scenes. And so you have us, but we are so excited because we have our dear friends with us today, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and um, I'll introduce them properly in just a minute. So they're like family to us, and I love them so very much, and you are going to enjoy this broadcast today, even as I was reading their brand new book just last night. It is, I literally couldn't put it down. It is so intriguing and you are going to love it too. But before we do that, Mondo, is there any latest news we need to get oh, to? Oh boy, yeah, yeah, it's overwhelming. Everything that is taking place, play, pray for America, pray for Central America. My family got hit horrible with this last hurricane. They lost their home. Really? They lost a lot of their land. And now there's a new uh, hurricane on the horizon already hitting Nicaragua and wow. Honduras, headed to Guatemala and then back to the coast, in the Gulf Coast. But let me give you a yes. few headlines to let you know where we are around the world. This happened a few days ago in Texas. Thousands of desperate Texans wait in line at drive through food bank in hopes of getting one of the 7,000 frozen turkeys ahead of the holiday. Texas became the first U.S. state to report 1 million confirmed cases of coronavirus, with more than 119,000 of those cases reported in Dallas County. Hmm. This is another one. This should bring uh, an update on what is taking place regarding religious uh, liberty in America. Alito sounds the alarm. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito is sounding the alarm. Religious liberty is in danger of becoming a second class right. And this is what the judge is saying. And I quote, it pains me to say this, but in certain quarters, religious liberty is fast becoming a disfavored right, end of quote, he said, citing COVID restrictions that blatantly discriminated, discriminated against houses of worship. Hmm. Now, let me take you all the way to where in England this is taking place. This is according to Breitbart. Good Lord, says the headline. In London, police in London, England, break up baptism for breaching coronavirus restrictions. Pastor of the church, uh, Regan King, says, and I quote, we were told not to have a baptism and police began to block people from entering the church. So mm. we decided to make uh, other arrangements. Wow. That is just some of the news that is taking place around the country, mm. around the world. But we're watching as this political environment taking place is becoming mm -hmm. more hostile than ever before. This is one of the headlines, according to uh, one of the websites. If Americans can no longer trust or elections, we're in big trouble. Another one here, according to the Epoch Times, battles between freedom and communism. Boston stopped the steal, rallied marchers. And we're watching this political environment just take place. But Bill O'Reilly is predicting a collapse of cable news network post-Trump. And we're watching that development. I, I say that because so many stories are taking place around this nation that are developing stories. But pray for America. Let me give you one last one just so you and I can stay, uh, you know, ahead of the game and pray for our country. Uh, this is another one. And I think we saw this a few days ago. Charisma Magazine put this out. Charisma News. CN Morning Rundown. Violent anti-Trump protesters march D.C.'s million uh, MAGA march. And we saw a brutal attack taking place where Black Lives Matter protester and Antifa decided to attack uh, some of the marchers there. Again, you don't see Republicans marching and looting and, and rioting and burning buildings down, but they are being targeted like never before. But there's big warning that if Joe Biden gets in office, religious freedom will be under attack like no, like mm. we never seen before. 
People like Not James good. Dobson, people like Franklin Graham are sounding the alarm, warning churches, ministries to be ready and some even be ready with lawyers. Wow. That's I think we're ahead of that game already. Yeah, I, I think so, too. As you, as you very well know, if you watch this broadcast on a regular basis, we've been under attack since, you know, early part of this year. And we understand what it's like to go through it. And we're still going right. through the, le- the legalities. And, and um, we've been talking recently with you about the Legal Recovery Fund to help us because not only did are they holding $2 million of, of your money, you know, really, of our money, the partner's money, but, but it's cost us, you know, several hundred thousand dollars to retain attorneys and still working on a, on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's close to half a million dollars. And that, so we're asking people to stand with us and help us with whatever you can help us with for the, what we call the Legal Recovery F- Fund, as you can see it on your screen. You know, if it's $25, if it's $50, if it's $100, if it's $10,000, whatever you can help us. Because, we, you know, Jim, he is a builder and he ha- is a visionary. This is the day of the apostle. This is the day of the prophet. This is the day for people to know what's going on, where it seems to be those offices in the past just kind of seem to go away. And now, you know, we're, we're, we're saying we, it's time to raise up these voices. And so today we have people like Derek and Sharon Gilbert who are with us who teach us so much and we want to welcome them to our program today, our dear friends, and they truly are dear friends. Derek and Sharon Gilbert. Derek is the host of Skywatch TV and the 5 in 10 news program. He is the author of many books, including Clash of the Titans and Bad Moon Rising. Sharon is the author of many books, including The Red Wing Saga and co-host on Skywatch TV. Derek and Sharon are co-authors of the book Veneration and now their latest book, you're going to love it, Giants, Gods, and Dragons. They also co-host Unraveling Revelation and Sci Friday, seen on the PTL Network, Voice of the Prophets. Derek and Sharon, welcome to the Jim Baker Show. We sure love you guys. Thank you so much, Lori. We love you so much. You're family. You are our family. You are. True. We really are. And it is an honor to have intelligent Uh, family members that love God with all of their heart and soul and mind and seek the truth out, which that's what you are to me. You can ask anybody around me, my kids or anything, what does it for me? People who love the Lord with all their heart, their soul and their mind. And this brand new book, I'm really excited to talk with you about this because I've really just been getting into it. And it is, I literally was just turning page after page last night. And it was just because it's so brand new. Hot off the press. But before we get into that, Derek, I just want to ask you a question. And what is ha- happening with this election process? Well, the president has assembled a really top-notch legal team. Rudy Giuliani, uh, Joe DiGenova, another former federal prosecutor. Uh, among the team that he's assembled, we should see something happen. Um, obviously, the statistical improbability of what's happened, that the Republicans would win 11 seats back in the House, defeating Democrat incumbents. They would win uh, enough in the Senate to hold the Senate. They would win most of the state legislative races that uh, that were competitive. And yet Joe Biden, we're supposed to believe, received more votes than any presidential candidate in history, running, swimming against the tide of this red wave that uh, was evident everywhere else in the country. That just doesn't make any sense. The question is whether they can prove it in a court of law. The thing we need to remember, though, I think above all, is that if by some legal maneuvering or chicanery or whatever, Joe Biden is inaugurated on January 20th of 2021. Sharon said this a couple of weeks ago, just to keep my head straight, because I'm in the news every day while she's in the 19th century working on the Red Wing saga, said, look, If Joe Biden is inaugurated, it's only because the one who spoke the universe into existence, the one who raises raises up kings and tears them down, is allowing it because he's going to do something else. So let's pray and then stand back and marvel at what God is about to do. Amen to that, because when the church is under pressure, 
that's when we are refined and that's when we deploy. And that's exactly what we need to do. That's good. That's a very <laughs> excellent reminder, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with Derek yes. and Darren sharing wow. that with Derek sharing that with us because this is something we have to we have to keep, you know, our mind in tune with. Mm -hmm. And I love what you just said. When we're under pressure, then mm. we're going we go through that refiner's fire and we want God's will to be done in this country as well as in our own personal lives. Derek, do you think that this election will go to the Supreme Court? It's very possible. I mean, clearly you've got a fighter in President Trump who's not going to concede. He's not going to give in until all of his uh, avenues have been uh, exhausted. But I think what we're seeing on the other side is a, uh, a globalist uh, cabal that wants him out of office in a big way. In fact, Sharon and I were talking about this this morning, and I know we'll get into this as we discuss the book Giants, Gods, and Dragons, because this cabal, operating as the human front of the uh, principalities and powers behind the scenes want to take us back to Babel. Donald Trump stands in the way of that as the, uh, the uh, chief executive officer of the most powerful nation on earth. A year ago, in fact, almost one year to the day from Inauguration Day 2021, on January 21st of 2020, he addressed the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, and gave a very nationalistic speech talking about how uh, America is coming back. It's a blue-collar revolution. We've got more people at work. We are doing well. And I wish. And he actually said, I, I want all of your countries to do well. May God bless all of your countries and God bless America. But the way it was categorized in the media at the time was defiant, uh, anti, you know, uh, uh, isolationist even. They don't want a powerful America standing on its own and doing what's best for Americans. They want us subsumed into this new world order which will be a globalist world order. Again, it's, it's taking us back to Babel. And I think that's why they are working so hard to destroy Donald Trump and anyone who supports him. So this will be a fight that will be played out to the end. And, but as I said, as Sharon rightly pointed out, we know that our hope is not in this life only. And so we need to keep our eyes on that prize, which is the, the kingdom that is to come. So if by chance, if it plays out that Mr. Biden is inaugurated on January 20th. We just need to prepare to get out there and be about the Lord's business as ambassadors for the kingdom. Amen to that. Amen. We all, we all say amen. Those who are watching, amen. That's what we say. And, and we just stay strong in the things of God. That's the most important thing personally and with those around us and and let's not forget to not forsake ourselves together in these last days as the word says and even more so as we see that day approach okay i am so excited guys to get into your new book this is really something giants gods and dragons derek and sharon why did you title this book giants gods and dragons over the summer, I read a story about uh, players of a, a game called Dungeons and Dragons. You may have heard of it. It's a, a role-playing game in which uh, you play, take on the role of a character in, involved in a quest, and uh, you engage with all sorts of mystical and magical creatures. It's not something we recommend for Christians to play, but the point was that the players of this game were upset at the way some of the characters were depicted, specifically the orcs. Now, if you're familiar with J.R.R. Tolkien and his Lord of the Rings, the orcs were these evil, violent creatures that were, had been created by twisting elves and torturing them and, and basically turning mm -hmm. them into uh, uh, unredeemable, evil, violent, uh, deadly characters you would not want to live next door to. Um, but the players of the game got upset because they were always depicted as evil and they assumed that it must be because racism. <laughs> Because the elves are always depicted as light-skinned, but artistic and musical and good and kindly and gentle and so on and so on. So they protested, and the creators of the game, Dungeons & Dragons, said, okay, we're, we'll change it so in the future, if you want to be a good orc, you can be a good orc. Now, we can laugh at that. We can laugh at that and say, these people are taking this <laughs> fictional world so seriously, they're actually protesting on behalf of the orcs. But... Research, and in fact, uh, just a, a new story today from the George Barna uh, Research Group, which is now at Arizona Christian University, on the state of American Christianity. And we find that the church in America 
is moving farther and farther away from biblical truth. Evangelicals, a majority of evangelicals, according to this new survey, 52% reject absolute moral truth. Well, what is God if not absolute moral truth? What is his word if not absolute moral truth? Nearly half of American Christians of all types believe that we can earn our way into heaven, 48%. If we do enough good works, we can earn our way into heaven. That's Christianity 101. There is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. And yet American Christians are becoming more and more like we are conforming to the world. And it dawned on me <clears throat> that while we can laugh at the Dungeons and Dragons players for taking the fictional realm so seriously, they're acting as though it's real, we Christians are taking the real word of God and treating it and the characters in it as though they're fiction. Yes, yes. Instead, we need to understand that the Bible is history, and it is his story as well, from the very first pen stroke to the very last one, Alpha to Omega, Genesis to the end of Revelation. Sadly, there are a lot of churches, Lori, and you know this, that have decided they're going to cut off the ends of the Bible. We don't like Genesis, and we don't like Revelation. They say things that make us feel guilty mm -hmm. and bad, and we don't like that. And then they start going through the rest of the Bible and saying, no, we don't like this part. We don't like that part. We don't like this idea of sin. We don't like this idea that we need a Redeemer. But we want to keep a sort of a cartoon Jesus that makes us feel good. Wow, that is a, that's quite a statement, and it's a very true statement. In your, in your new book, you talk about dragons. Are dragons real, Derek? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The Bible makes it very clear that we've got a couple of major dragons that we have to deal with. And I want to point out for the fans of Lord of the Rings that while smog was really dangerous, the dragons in the Bible have seven heads. So that's like seven times smog. So this is really bad. Uh, we, of course, we know in Revelation 13, Satan is described as the seven-headed red dragon who makes war on Michael and the, and the saints and mm -hmm. is cast down from heaven, uh, seven heads and seven diadems. But there's also another dragon that as we dug into the book, and we talked, uh, in fact, Josh Peck and I wrote a little bit about this in our, our previous book, uh, uh, The Day the Earth Stands Still, the idea of chaos. And I know Pastor Jim has preached on the spirit of Leviathan in the past. And as we researched more about this, we realized that this is a story that you see in many of the ancient Mesopotamian religions, this idea that chaos had to be subdued by a warrior god in order to produce the natural world that we see around us. But that's in the Bible. The Bible's the original story. We see it in Genesis 1, verse 2, where the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. In Hebrew, that word is tahom, which is a cognate, which means same word, different language, to the Sumerian word tiamat, which was the multi-headed chaos dragon. In the Sumerian story of uh, Anu or Enlil or Marduk, the story changed over time against the chaos monster who had to be defeated to create heaven and earth. So we've got this multi-headed dragon, which we see then described by, uh, by Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 27. We see it in Job. Job chapter 41 gives a lengthy description of Leviathan, which is describing this character with, uh, with a back, with uh, you know, plates like shields that fit together, and his sneezes bring forth light, and his breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth from his mouth. He's describing a dragon, but Isaiah makes it clear it has multiple heads. And this is consistent with the pagan stories from the ancient world. What's really intriguing is that the, uh, the Bible uses the word sea in the Old Testament, yam in Hebrew, which was the name of this chaos monster in the Canaanite religion, to describe or to represent the bottomless pit or chaos, primordial chaos. So there are times in the Old Testament where the sea is referenced when in fact it's just a symbol representing the chaos that God, our creator, has subdued. When we get into the book of Revelation, the end times, Revelation 21, the very last enemy that's subdued by God, when he creates the new heaven and the new earth, the sea is no more. Praise God. Why mention the sea separately? If there's a new earth, you would assume the oceans and all the waters. Would be. No, it's because the sea is a reference to this primordial chaos dragon, Leviathan, Rahab, 
And that is the fine. It's a it's a a counterfeit alpha and omega. We see it in Genesis one verse two. The very first rebel God subdues, and the very last rebel defeated by God in Revelation twenty one. Leviathan chaos, the seven headed dragon that uh, is influencing the things happening on our streets today. That's, that was going to be my question right there. So is Levi so Leviathan is a dragon, and and I mean, listen, people, just go exactly to the Word of God and to back up exactly what 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 Derek is sharing with you and what we've talked with you about over the years is just go to Job 41. It is a very lengthy description of Leviathan. And so y you believe then you're saying, Derek, that what's going on in our streets today is that Leviathan, that Antichrist spirit, would that be right? Yes, yes, exactly. The Antichrist spirit, because we believe that Leviathan is, in fact, that multi-headed dragon with 10 diadems. Interestingly, mm -hmm. it's got 10 diadems and Satan only has seven. Which I is know. Interesting. And in the book of Revelation, we see that that beast has a rider. It's a woman. Well, there's an entity called Inanna that all of the entities, these are all fallen angels. After the flood, the Lord sent down, he said, 70 angels, 70 of his. At that point, they weren't fallen, but he put them in charge of the tribes, in charge of the nations. And they decided that they wanted to be worshipped as gods. So these fallen angels did not have a gender in heaven. But when they came to earth, they could choose to appear male or female. Well, Inanna is one of these genderless fallen angels that has decided to appear female. But the thing is, Inanna has this following that loved her in Mesopotamia because she was able to make you turn from male to female or turn from female to male or something in between. She was the queen of gender fluidity. And that is the spirit that is running the world today. Inanna wants to remove all binary systems. She wants to remove the idea that there's a man and a woman because that is God's design. And she is using the chaos monster. She is using Leviathan to promulgate, to put forward that idea and build a new world order. But the day is coming when that beast is going to say, oh, thanks a lot, don't need you anymore. And she's gone. Yeah, even though Leviathan, chaos, has been subdued, it is not ultimately defeated. That doesn't happen until Revelation 21. That spirit can still influence the world today. In fact, we've seen for the last hundred years a growth in a form of occult magic called chaos magic, which is literally trying to summon this chaos spirit and bring it forth on earth. Now, of course, the odds not, it will only have as much leash as God allows it to have. These uh, people who are practicing the dark arts, the occult, they're not opening portals and, and, and commanding these entities to do anything. Uh, only what God allows them. What they are doing is allowing them, giving them permission to rule their own lives. But there is a day coming when, as Sharon said, Inanna, uh, also known as Ishtar and Aphrodite, mm -hmm. Astarte in the Bible, uh, Venus. Uh, she, and I would argue that she might even be Artemis, which is yep. Apollo's sister. Yeah, oh, yeah, Artemis, the, uh, w w whose temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, she and Leviathan apparently are working in concert to manifest uh, this Antichrist spirit on earth. But as Sharon said, a day is coming, as we see in the book of Revelation, when the uh, kings of the earth turn on her and devour her and burn her with fire. And so it... it we, we see in the, the spirit realm, when you start digging into it in Scripture, hints that they don't all work together, just as not all Republicans work together, not all Democrats work together. We see the same kind of political infighting taking place in the spirit realm, which is far more active than we've been taught. And that's really what we're trying to communicate with giants, gods, and dragons. These entities are real. They have their own agenda, and... We can learn a lot about them by digging into the original languages of Scripture. Amen to that. In the Red Wing Saga, I tried to use fiction to teach the, these ideas. And 
one thing that's really become uh, so, so much a part of my day, every day, I remind myself that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Those are people who are believers who've gone on and they're cheering us on at the rail. But I believe those witnesses include angels that the Lord puts here to protect us and to hold back the enemy so that we can run that race. That's powerful, Sharon, Derek, both of you. Excellent. This book, everybody everybody needs to get a ha- their hands on this book. It is so fascinating. And I love how you describe it in the back. Giants are real. The small G, gods of the pagans are real. Dragons are real. And they're preparing for the final war with God. In this book, Giants, gods, and dragons is a fresh look at the end of days, drawing on the worldview of the prophets and apostles who understood that the spirit realm is far more real than we've been taught. And it goes on to say, and in this book, you're going to discover the identities of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Mm -hmm. the connections between Babel, Babylon, and what's in your wallet, the dragons who will walk the earth in the last days, the name of the first spirit to rebel against God, hint, it wasn't Satan. The connection between the reptilian figurines of summer and the ancient practice of human head shaping. Oh, that was fascinating too. Oh my gosh, I can go on and on on this, on the just what's on the back of this book and what I read in your book. And every single person will find you're going to, it's going to take you places that you never even have been taught before. And yet it is actual, all real. It's all biblical. It's all true. So you can receive one of these books for a $25 donation to the ministry, which includes shipping and handling, or you can receive the friends and family offer. I like to call it, but the, uh, yeah, there it is. Friends and family offer. You can receive, is it Three, Three. okay, three books for $50 um, donation to the ministry or more, I always Mm -hmm. say too, which a lot of you do. A lot of you, I read your cards and letters and a lot of you will include, tuck a little extra in to help the expenses of the ministry and we appreciate that so much. So that's for $50 and that includes shipping and handling and this would be something so fascinating to to uh, give out to those people who want to know more, who want to delve in deeper uh, as opposed to just just reading and thinking they understand because Derek and Sharon have done the study. They've done the work for you. And you will, like I keep saying, fascinating. You're, it's intriguing. You're going to turn page after page after page. So, Derek, are there other dragons in the Bible? Well, one of the things that really surprised us when we were digging into uh, just trying to identify and make, get a better understanding of the spirit realm, when you look at the seraphim, uh, we, we've heard of the cherubim and the seraphim, and, and actually the proper Hebrew pronunciation, we've been informed by our tour guides in Israel is cherubim, uh, but the seraphim uh, mentioned in the book of Isaiah, uh, his throne room vision in Isaiah 6, that's really where they're mainly mentioned, but they're also referenced, if you look at the original Hebrew in the book of Numbers, the episode where the uh, Israelites are in the desert and they're bitten by these fiery serpents. Well, the, word, uh, the words in Hebrew, fiery serpent, is actually saraf nakash. Now, nakash is the Hebrew word that is used for the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, the rebel in the garden, Satan. So you've got this idea that this saraf nakash is interchangeable. We also see that Isaiah uses those words interchangeably when he describes the flying serpents of the Negev, which is the desert in the south of Israel. So you get this idea of a flying, fiery serpent. And the fiery part comes from the word, the original word in Hebrew, seraph, which is a verb that means to burn. So seraphim literally means the burning ones. So you get this idea of these flying, fiery serpents. Well, what would you call a flying, fiery serpent in English? A dragon. So you've got these entities that apparently serpentine, fiery, able to fly. Interesting, when you look at the iconography, the art of the religious art of ancient Mesopotamia, you see that uh, dragons are often depicted as the associates of the gods of ancient Mesopotamia. 
interestingly, they also don't look like what we think of as dragons. Our idea, our concept of dragons has been shaped by modern fantasy fiction as these big flying reptiles. But in ancient Mesopotamia, they would often look like lion snakes or uh, dog snakes or bull snakes. Or it, it, goat snakes. Goat snakes. They would have these different, uh, yeah, like Capricorn actually mm-hmm. was a goat fish. They had these weird chimeric uh, looks to them. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the sacred animal to the chief Babylonian god Marduk was sort of a lion dragon. So when we look at the, uh, the dragon in, or the beast that emerges from the sea at the end of Revelation 12, beginning of Revelation 13, um, we think, okay, it's got the uh, you know, leopard, bear, lion type thing. That, that's not a dragon, but it is. That is exactly how dragons were depicted in ancient Mesopotamia. So yes, there are dra- lion type thing. That, that's not a dragon, but it is. That is exactly how dragons were depicted in ancient Mesopotamia. So yes, there are dragons other than the beast from the sea. And- yeah, and I got to think of another word, but this is excellent. Okay, I, I have a question for you. Are the four horsemen of the apocalypse riding now? We believe they are. We believe that they began riding in the first century A.D., when Jesus ascended and arrived in the throne room. You see it in the book of Revelation. What does John see? He sees the Lord arriving. There's a point, though, where they cannot find him. Remember how the Lord has the scroll in his right hand, Mm -hmm. and an angel asks who is worthy to open the scroll, and John sees that there is no one, not in heaven, not on earth, and not under the earth, Mm -hmm. which means that Jesus was somewhere in between. He was ascending at that very second. But then the lamb who has been slain arrives in the throne room, and he stands next to his father. He's right there inside the caravim, which means he's in the holy place. Mm -hmm. Only God is allowed there. So the, the lamb arrives and the father hands him the scroll. And then the seals start to, I mean, the trump, yeah, the seals start to come off. And he opens up this, this document that proves that Jesus now owns the earth. Mm-hmm. He has redeemed us from the enemy. And as he opens those seals, the first four are the riders. So we believe that those riders have been riding for over 2,000 years. Yes, we, in Revelation 5, verse 6 is where Jesus uh, appears in heaven and takes the scroll. But we know that Jesus was at the right hand of the Father at the time the epistles were written by uh, you know, Paul and, and Peter and John. In fact, Stephen, the martyr, Stephen, mm-hmm. uh, probably around 37 A.D. was uh, you know, looked up as he was being stoned and saw Christ at the right hand of the Father. Exactly. So if, if he was there then... Then why? So we believe what John saw around 90 A.D., so some 60 years later, 50 years later, was a view of the past, what had already taken place. Yeah, passed to him. Passed to him, right. Uh, So, you know, we understand why uh, traditional futurist teaching on and we are futurists. We believe that, and we're pre-trip. And pre-trip, just so you know. Yeah. Uh, So we we believe that most of what's in the Book of Revelation and in Daniel and Ezekiel and so forth are still to be fulfilled, but uh, we think those seals began to open when Jesus appeared in heaven, Mm -hmm. which took place, well, after the 40 days he spent with the apostles and and his disciples. And you can see throughout history that that waves of, of pandemics and world wars and economic disasters and the release of all sorts of as we said, diseases in the pandemics. These are the things the riders do. Death has a great, you know, role to play in all of this because all of those things, the economic disasters, the the plagues, the the warfare, uh, conquest going out, those all result in a high death count. Death has been riding. Yeah, well, and here's what's fascinating to me again, what you talked about in your book. In your book, you make the case that these four writers of Revelation 6 are actual beings and not yes. symbols of conquest or war or famine and pestilence. Can you explain that for us? Well, the fourth writer 
is named, and he has a, someone riding along with him. Thanatos is the fourth rider. Thanatos is actually an entity. He's a psychopomp that carries you from one reality into another. In other words, he takes us from life to death, to the underworld. He brings Hades with him. Hades is an entity. And it's interesting, the word that is actually used to say that he is accompanied by Hades is a word that implies Hades is a fan, a fanboy to Thanatos. He is a follower. He's not following as in, it's a, a sequential in time. It's following as in, I really like you, and I believe in you. I'm one of your biggest fans. That's Hades following Thanatos. Death is one of the major enemies of Christ's uh, a life here on earth because when he died and rose again, he proved that we would have eternal life. And those who die, the Rephaim, those Nephilim, the, the spirits of the, the, the Rephaim who are in the valley of the shadow of death, they will remain dead. Death, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? It is gone. Jesus won it. And so as we looked at the fourth rider and his uh, fanboy, yes. his, his squire. Uh, and, <laughs> That's what he is. He's the squire. Yeah. I love that. Here, let me put your armor on, Ben. Yeah. Uh, we we st st decided to apply the, the, uh, the research of Dr. Michael Heiser, who's been a guest on your program, uh, and his divine counsel worldview, mm -hmm. which is this idea that was well known. I mean, this was the worldview of the prophets and the apostles. They understood that the spirit realm was real and the gods or the pagans were just fallen angels. So they knew that Hades was real, Thanatos mm -hmm. was real. It's like, okay, so why do we just assume then that the first three writers are just symbols and not angelic entities? They're real and some of their weapons are actually demonic entities. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, we had covered this during our, uh, as we went through Revelation 5 and 6 in our uh, Unraveling Revelation program on the PTL network. And so we just incorporated that and put that into the book. And as we looked at the clues in Scripture and what the apostles knew about the Greek world around them, because they'd been under the control of Greek-speaking foreigners for, oh, almost 400 years by the time John wrote the book of Revelation, we thought we could make a pretty good guess uh, as to who those first three riders actually were, and we name them in, uh, in the book. Who are the four horsemen then? <laughs> <laughs> well, good question, Laurie. Well, well we now, know the fourth one is Thanatos, yeah. and he's got Hades with him, so the first rider. Well, the first rider, the rider on the white horse, has often been identified as uh, Jesus because later in Revelation 19, he appears on a white horse. But when we look at the weapon and the accoutrement, so I, Ooh, good one. Yeah, eight years of French in high school ah. and college. That's all I remember. And w we see that this cannot possibly be Jesus. The, the first rider, Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2, we see the rider has a bow and a crown, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Well, the bow is not the weapon that Jesus carries in Revelation 19. He carries a sword. So first of all, there's that. Uh, now, what entity in the ancient world carried a bow? the most prominent among the Greek gods, and he's got a counterpart among the Canaanite gods and the Babylonian gods, uh, is Apollo, known to the Canaanites as Reshef and to the Babylonians as Nergal. He was a plague god who spread plague with his arrows. And we got an email this morning from a friend who watches us on uh, Unraveling Revelation. He said, you know that the, uh, the word for um, arrow and dart in Hebrew and Greek are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And could that possibly mean like a hypodermic needle? Well, yeah, so the, 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 word itself, the word itself that's translated as arrow, toxon, actually refers to the flight path. Mm -hmm. So I don't think a, a needle is going to be flying No, that's at true. Uh, but, again, but the more important thing about Apollo is the crown yes. this entity is wearing. We'd mentioned the diadem worn by, or the diadems worn by the uh, 
uh, Leviathan, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Antichrist, the beast, and of Satan. Uh, this crown, however, the English word doesn't do it justice. It's called Stephanos. It's a crown of victory, not a crown of royalty. It's a crown of lo laurel leaves given to victors in the Olympic Games. It later became the symbol of the Roman emperors. But what's interesting is that according to Greek religion, we call it mythology, but it was their religion, they believed that it was created by the god Apollo. Apollo had uh, chased after a uh, river nymph who... Uh, wanted to get away from him, so she prayed to her, her father, who was a river god, to change mm. her into a tree. He turned her into a laurel, and Apollo said he would always keep her close by. I created this laurel crown, and so that became a symbol of victory. And uh, again, the Roman emperors adopted it as their symbol. You see statues of uh, uh, Caesar Augustus or Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. and they'll have the laurel leaf crown. Right. But that is a Again, that is very different from the diademos, the diadem. And we see in Revelation 19, Jesus wears many diadems, not just seven or ten, many. And here you've got this character, the rider on the white horse, wearing just the one. So what does it mean conquering and to conquer? Apollo was known as a god of oracles, a god of uh, art. He was a, a player on the lyre. Uh, he was sort of the ideal of Greek and Roman youth, a beardless god uh, who was, uh, well, was lusted after by both women and yes, men. Yes, exactly. Um, but when you look at Western civilization, and I'm talking now about the United States of America, Western Europe, much of the foundation of our civilization is based on Greek and Roman philosophy, literature, law, art, and I, we, we argue in the book that that is the conqueror, uh, that that is how Apollo, this first writer, conquered. Look at our, our government buildings and the architecture of our government buildings, the Supreme Court, the Capitol building, um, many of our state capitals based on Greek and Roman architecture, which essentially means it was derived from Greek and Roman pagan temples. Mm -hmm. Here in Missouri, our state capital is topped by a statue of the goddess Ceres, the grain goddess. Uh, there was a big our local state senator uh, actually tried to uh, get a bill passed to keep the statue off the Capitol. It had been taken down for refurbishing this year, 2020. Um, and, of course, the uh, media out of Kansas City, Springfield, St. Louis, just mocked him as a backward, Bible-thumping uh, rube from the, uh, from the sticks. But think about it. Here in this supposedly Christian country, why do we have so much pagan statuary on top of our government buildings? Why do our government buildings all look like pagan statues, pagan, pagan temples? The Statue of Liberty is actually a pagan statue. And we argue that this is the, uh, the conquest of Apollo. This information is so captivating. We're all sitting here just like in <laughs> awe yes. and learning so much here on the set. I think everyone that's watching right now needs to call and order this book today. The information that you're hearing right now, I can tell you for a fact, you're not hearing this anywhere else right. except for Skywatch TV, of course, on the PTL television network as well. But you can call today and order just one copy for a donation of $25 to the ministry. Mm -hmm. Or if you'd like to take advantage of the friends and family offer, mm -hmm. Giants, Gods and Dragons friends and family offer for a donation of $50 to the ministry, you're going to receive three of these books. And that includes shipping and handling as well. You know, I think young people, Derek and yes. Sharon, I don't know what you think about it, but, you know, young people have been so intrigued. When I say young people, I mean, I'm in my 60s. So, you know, to me, young now is in your 40s or, mm. you know, Mondo, I guess you're in your 40s. <laughs> you're young. But people who have been yeah. captivated over the years yes. or intrigued over the years with all the different, like you were mentioning earlier, oh, Derek, you know, Dungeons and Dragons yeah. and all these different things that I think that this would be an amazing gift to give yeah. to even even at Christmas time guys it may not just wrap it up and give it to a grandson or granddaughter or just somebody that you know in your life yeah. that, that that this way they can know the truth and yeah. it's the truth that sets people yeah. free you know it helps us discover the mysteries that the Bible it has does. And, you know Sunday school teachers 
don't teach this. Of course, Sunday morning pulpits don't teach this because it's, it's so deep and you want to be able to understand what the dragon, you know, it's almost like the untouched Holy Grail of the Bible. You can't read about that. You can't teach about that. Well, I want to tell you something. When you start learning about the dragons and you start learning about the white horse and you start learning about the giants, you understand the Bible so clearly yes. to where we are right now. It comes from here. The Word of Isn't God. Isn't that amazing? They yeah. come from, and then, of course, you guys put it together in such a way that you can understand it. Yes. And begin, listen, if America goes into a lockdown, like Again? they're predicting, <laughs> it, it's unbelievable, the reports, you are going to want to have information that helps you understand. Go back to the Word. I love what you said earlier on the program. You know what? It doesn't matter who our president is next. We pray for the leaders that God puts and, and takes away but more than that, it's time for us to go back to the Word. Understand that the greatest tool we have is to evangelize the world and to make disciples. But people today, you know, Dad said a few years ago, there's going to be a time where the famine of the Word of God is going to be so clearly that people are not going to know what the Bible even says anymore. We have to go back to the Word and understand deeply. To have an intimate relationship with Christ is to go back to the Old Testament and marry it with the Revelation and understand what is this gods, the little gods that the Bible talks about. But giants, gods, and dragons, if that's not an attraction to you, I don't know about you, but I want to tell you something. Mateo, Jackson, Olivia, I'm sure Mila, they want to understand this because that's what they're marketing to us right that's now. That's right, Mondo. And Derek and Sharon have done all of the amazing research, like Mom was sharing with you at the beginning of the program, their intelligence. They've used their God-given brains to do yes. all of the work for, for us right. so that we can be fed the Word of God. And they quote the Word of God so many times to Amen. help us go back to the Scripture Amen. and find where this is. So I love it. Thank I you so too. much this for so writing good. this. And what else you'll find in this book is the identity of Nimrod and the true location of Babel, mm. the identity of Gog, of Magog, hint, he's not Russian. Listen, I want to go into that real quick, uh, Derek, with you and Sharon. But Derek, what is the connection between Gog of Magog, Leviathan, and the Antichrist? Well, Gog of Magog, uh, to our Jewish brothers and sisters who study end time prophecy, and there, there are some who do, uh, he is the great end times enemy of God. In other words, in Christian terms, Gog of Magog is the Antichrist. What's interesting is that the reference to the uttermost north, where he rallies his troops, uh, we see that Gog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 comes from the uttermost north. That phrase in Hebrew, we've got to go look at the Hebrew, is Yarkate Tzaphon. Oh, good. You yeah. did that right. Yeah, Very well, good. again, he's our tour guys in Israel were working with me. And that's a reference to a mountain known very well in the ancient world called Mount Zephon, where everybody in the ancient world knew that's where the storm god's palace was located. Well, the Canaanites called the storm god Baal. The Greeks called him Zeus. The Romans called him Jupiter. And that location was known not only as the place where Baal had his palace, but it was known as the site of the epic battle between Zeus, the storm god, and the chaos monster Typhon. Typhon, in fact, got his name from the mountain Zaphon. Or the other way around. We or the other it. way around, one or the other. But it's, it's connected. Now, of course, the real story is that God subdued Typhon, Leviathan, the chaos monster. But when Gog of Magog comes from the uttermost north, he's not coming from geographic north. He's coming from cosmic or spiritual or supernatural north. That mountain where Baal's palace was located. And remember, in the New Testament, when Jesus was accused of casting out demons by the power of Baal Zebul, which means Baal the prince, Jesus connected him to Satan. Satan can't struggle and fight against himself. How will his house stand? In, in per, uh, Revelation 2, where he's talking to the, the letter to the city of Pergamum, I know where you live, where Satan dwells. That's a reference to the great altar of Zeus. So Zeus, Baal, Satan... His mountain, Mount Zephon, that's connected to the chaos dragon. And when, uh, at the end of Revelation 12, the dragon stands on the shore of the sea and the beast emerges from the sea, we think what we're talking about here is this connection to this mountain of the storm god Satan the, and the Antichrist, 
Gog of Magog, the Antichrist, is sort of his commander-in-chief and leads the army against Israel for the final showdown at Armageddon. Yes, that's a good way to put that. So fascinating, again, uh, intriguing, captivating. Mm -hmm. So who are the Rephaim of the Old Testament, and why do you think they will fight at the Battle of Armageddon? Well, bottom line, the Rephaim are demons. They're the spirits of the Nephilim who were the children, the hybrid children between the angels who came down to Mount Hermon, the watchers, who came down to Genesis 6, and they saw the daughters of men, and they thought they were fair, and so they took them. And they bore, these women bore children that were fathered by fallen angels. These Nephilim, that's what they were called, they're giants. When they died in the flood, their spirits were still allowed to wander the earth. That's why when Jesus cast out demons in the first century, he was actually going up against the giants of the pre-flood war. Uh, the Rephaim live in a valley that you can see from Mount Nebo. So when we're in Israel, we, we look over and we just laugh. Hmm. The, the key to this is in Ezekiel 39, Ezekiel 39, verse 11, where God describes the ending of the war of Gog and Magog. And he says he'll prepare a place for burial in Israel for the, uh, the, the hordes of Magog. Um, and it, it, he said, it will, it will, the valley of the travelers east of the sea, and it will block the travelers. And that term, that word, travelers, was always a puzzle until the last 40 years. We're living in the first generation that has access to some of these pagan texts from the ancient world that help us to understand. The, the Rephaim were not invented by, by Moses. The, their pagan neighbors, the, the Amorites, the Canaanites, they knew who the Rephaim were. In fact, they venerated them, which is where we got the title of our last book, Veneration. Uh, they performed these rituals, these necromancy rituals, to summon them. And in some of these rituals, they are referred to as travelers in the sense that they travel or cross over from the land of the dead to the realm of the living. And that word in English, or in Hebrew rather, is afarim. Now, there's a reference to Avarim in the book of Deuteronomy when God tells Moses to climb Mount Nebo. He says, climb this mountain of the Avarim, climb this mountain of the travelers, so that he could get his only look at the promised land across from Jericho. So the plains of Moab, that area, that flat area on the east side of the Jordan River between Mount Nebo and Jericho uh, is, is essentially the valley of the travelers, and it will block the travelers. What does that mean? We believe what that means when you combine this with the prophecy of Isaiah 26, when, the prof when I Isaiah writes, they are dead, they will not live, they are shades, but in Hebrew it's Rephaim. They are Rephaim, they will not arise. Amen. We think what this means is that in 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul wrote at the last trump, we are raised incorruptible. As Sharon said earlier, they, the Rephaim, these demon spirits who will be at the battle of Gog and Magog, Armageddon, they will be blocked. They will not arise. They are still dead. Powerful stuff, everybody. It's so powerful that I, if, if Derek and Sharon, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep you around for a second day because I have a whole another page full of questions I, I would love to know the answers to. Everyone needs to get their hands on this book. And you can call us right now at 1-888-988-1588. And just for $25, Giants, Gods, and Dragons book offer, exposing the fallen realm and the plot to ignite the final war of the age. It is powerful. And to have Derek and Sharon write this and explain it to us so we can understand. So just us, for like me, for like Lori, the average person can understand this and, and just be so captivated by it and so intrigued by it and know that this is the word of God and they've helped us to put it into easy to understand verbiage for us, even though Derek says things amazing. 
I'm, I'm like over here clapping when Sharon's like, good job. You just got that. Um, I wish I could do it as well as you do. But um, uh, before we, we close, we do want to make sure that everybody is prepared. Now is the time to be prepared. And we have so many ways to help you prepare between food, between water. You know, what are some of the food offers, guys, that, that people could get today? Absolutely. Right now, they can get the Prepare Pantry 60 meal bucket for a donation of $155 to the ministry. We want to remind you that shipping is included. Shipping and handling is included in this offer. You're going to receive breakfast, soups, and entrees, add-ons such as sweetened banana chips, the low-fat milk, which is amazing. And that has... uh, Again, I want to remind you, recipes that are going to fill your stomach. That's These right. are exclusive recipes to the Jim Baker Show. As you know, our father and you and our team have created a lot of these recipes, but amazing buttermilk pancakes that you can make with it. By the way, that batter that you can use, I will use uh, what do you call uh, fried chicken. Oh, good I idea. love fried chicken. It tastes really good with this uh, buttermilk pancake. So you can receive, so you can receive one. one of them. Start with one if you're not sure. And if you want to do more than that, I urge you to go to the website jimbakershow.com and get yourself six, 12, or 24. But right now, start with one. This is the Prepare Pantry 60 Meal Bucket for a donation of $155 to the ministry. Yes, Mara. And while supplies last, we still have the large PH2O hydration bundle, which includes one large pH pitcher, the 96 ounce, that filters 200 gallons. And you'll also receive a bonus of one of the 50 ounce hydration bottles in your choice of pink or blue. Absolutely. I got one more. This is something that we cannot guarantee to be delivered by Christmas. But if I was you, I will order anyway. This is a special. This is the Christmas food bucket for a donation of $145 to the ministry. You'll receive, again, breakfast such as coffee, creamy wheat cereal, buttermilk pancakes, morning mousse, low-fat milk, black bean burger, mushroom rice pilaf, cheesy broccoli, the soups. I don't have time to name them all, but we are giving you a bonus of the two Master R Series box cards that include includes 12 cards and 12 envelopes each of those cards one of them being mary and baby jesus jesus and the children come unto me and you without sin this is an amazing offer for a donation of 145 dollars to the ministry the christmas food bucket that's right so call us right now 1-888-988-1588 or write us at p.o box 7330 branson missouri 656 one five better yet go to the website jimbakershow.com and there are all of the offers there and remember to get your book today giants gods and dragons if that is an intriguing title i don't know what it is and derek and sharon it's been such an honor to have you with us today stay tuned everybody for tomorrow because we are going to do part two of this amazing new book from derek and sharon Gil- Gilbert. And remember this, God loves you. He really does. Bye-bye for now.